Hi, everyone. Welcome to the second episode of Genealogy Pep Talk, a podcast. My name is Suzanne, and I am a library specialist with Arapaho Libraries here in Colorado. I am also here with two pals of mine, Cindy, another library specialist, and Katie, a reference librarian. Please say hello, co-hosts. Hello, I'm Cindy. Hey, I'm Katie. This podcast is about gathering some tips and tricks for your family search journey for whenever you get stuck on searching for an ancestor, because it does happen. We also share with you some of our own experiences, anecdotes, and stories in researching our own families. So if you have started your genealogy search, you will know that you need to have the basics for your journey. You will need some family names, along with significant dates like birth, marriage, and death, Having a birthplace or a city, state, and or country of residence, that also adds to the excitement. We mentioned in episode number one of this podcast about Ancestry.com, the library edition, but there is also another genealogy website to peruse through. It is conveniently located on the Arapaho Library's website. It is called My Heritage. As a reminder, you can find it under the Research tab, then click on Genealogy. You will see... It is the very last tab. My heritage is helpful as it may bring other records closer to you because they are not hidden or buried within the records. Another genealogy website to use is FamilySearch.org. This one is not on our website, but it is free to use. Once you have created a username and password, you are then all set to search for your people. I have found that FamilySearch.org filters your search and brings your person closer to the top of the list. This is quite helpful, especially when you have a very common last name. I mainly use Ancestry.com and FamilySearch.org in tandem. Katie and Cindy, what are your thoughts about MyHeritage and FamilySearch? Well, uh, this is Cindy, and I like to do exactly what you said, is to use Ancestry and Family Search together in tandem because I got a hit on Ancestry, and if you get a hit, it'll keep searching. If you get a hit, it will say in your email, you may have a hit, and go and check this out. Is this your actual relative or not? So I did. I clicked on that, and I found my great-grandmother, paternal great-grandmother, and Anna Serenko. I thought she had come from Ukraine, but she came from Austria, apparently. So then I went on to Family Search, and I kept getting all these other hits with the correct Anna Serenko because I was thinking it was the wrong area of Mm -hmm. Ukraine instead of Austria. And so that kind of opened up Mm -hmm. some doors, and that was really nice. Yeah. That's nice when that happens, too, because then you can kind of, okay, that's my person. Because you don't realize, you think your name is unique, but you don't realize that there's a lot more names out there of your name. <laughs> yeah, and I have, I thought I had an unusual maiden name, Hopko, yeah. but there's a lot out there too. Hmm. So it's not as unusual as I thought it was. Right. Yeah, I would agree. Um, Ancestry has definitely a lot of information, but sometimes I get bogged down in looking through all of it. Family search for me seems a little, maybe a little more organized when the results come up and uh, easier, less intimidating, I guess I should say, mm-hmm. to, to look at the results list. Mm-hmm. And, and I would agree that in my experience, the person I'm looking for seems to come up higher in the search results because my great grandfather, his name was Charles Friedrich Wilhelm. And so you can either find him under Charles, Charles F.W., C.F.W. So in Ancestry, I found that I have to really work down through the results and shift through a lot of things. Whereas with um, Family Search, the re- results I was looking for were more um, on the top and easier to get to. And I had an easier time kind of linking that to my family tree that I had started. So as with everything... One is not better than the other. They just have useful in different ways. So I think they're great tools to use together. I would agree with that. Nice. So for Ancestry, I like the images uh, seem to me a little bit better. Um, And it's the same image. It's of a picture of a census record or death record. But for whatever reason, uh, Ancestry just 
it seems to be easier to see and look at. And what is kind of neat, though, is that you ladies pulled up an image of a ship that a relative ancestor came on. Yeah, I definitely have. Both my grandparents, and they came from the port of Antwerp into New York City, Mm. and they actually did go through Ellis Island. That's how Mm I found that. So, And what I was very interesting to me was my grandmother came over in March of 1912. Mm. My grandfather came over in May of 1912. Mm. And in April of 1912, the Titanic sank. So I think my grandfather probably had a less pleasant trip, right. <laughs> uh, you know, at least emotionally, right. than my grandmother. So, but I do love that. And then going back to ancestry about the images with the census records and birth and death records, mm-hmm. I think they scan it in at a much higher resolution rate. Because I nice. have, yeah, because I have like zoomed in and in and in, and it's still crystal yeah. clear especially that little tiny writing on the top right. where it says, you know, not just the name, but the address. Uh, do they speak English? You know, what is their uh, occupation? Right. All those things are yeah. written very tinily up on the top. And yeah. so you can zoom up there and read it very clearly. Yeah. You know, what's interesting, though, is that if you hover near occupation, ancestry will bring it up and actually say what it is. So that's kind of nice. So you don't have to need yeah. a big magnifying glass and, you know, Mr. Magoo glasses or something. So <laughs> Yeah, it, that is so helpful, especially you know, yeah. when you need reading glasses, <laughs> you know. <laughs> right. Or just need new eyeballs, period, yeah. like I do. Family search, in my opinion, like I said earlier, it uh, seems to filter uh, your people up closer, you know, because I've just had a little bit better luck and you're searching and you're searching and you're like, oh, well, hey, there's so-and-so. Okay, that's great. And uh, because, you know, let's face it, with ancestry, sometimes it's like 5,000, 8,000, 10,000 records to go through. That's a lot of people to go through that's looking for one piece of sand in a bucket of sand. <laughs> so. I wonder if that has anything to do with the fact that maybe ancestry is so well used that there's a lot more user enter records Mm -hmm. and that can that really ups the chance for errors with my great grandfather and all the different variations of his name using initials or first name and initials and you know I have a really hard time trying to narrow down (laughs) which records are his in ancestry I found a lot more errors I think Mm. the last name because somebody who attached that record couldn't interpret the cursive or right. whatever correctly. Yeah, the writing. So I wonder if that's why ancestry can be a little bit more frustrating at times because there's just more user generated content. Whereas with family search, there maybe aren't as many people entering stuff as are just looking for records. Yeah, and that goes back to the same thing. If you don't know, when you just put in a date range, mm-hmm. And I, you know, I did find out that my grandparents came here from Poland in 1912, but at the time I didn't know. So you just put in, okay, so she was born around 1895 and 96. So you think, well, she was probably about 15, 16. That's what she said when she came over. So you just put in like, you know, a, a date. And so I put between 1910 and 1915, and that brings up tons of records. Mm. So when when you're using those date ranges, especially like dates of birth, because a lot of people don't know exactly when they were born or we don't know when they were born. (laughs) Right. You know, what year, what exact year. And and quite frankly, the family member may not know either because they may not realize just because of education level or if you're so rural out in the woods there, you know, that might be a, a part of it too is that, well, we don't know what it is, you know. Yeah, and, and it may be written down in a right. family Bible somewhere right. in Europe, mm-hmm. but of course the family right. still had that when the relative came over, so they may not even know. Right, and it could be a different mm-hmm. date. What's interesting is that I, my Swedish grandmother, remember, I thought she was a spy. She's not. Oh, that's too bad. <laughs> <laughs> right. Dad didn't really know her when she was born or the correct uh, timing, 
But uh, my grandfather was born in 1900, and so from the records it said so was my grandmother. But then I was like, this is too weird. It's too um, coincidental about the timing 1900 because I thought my dad had said at one point that, well, she didn't know when she was born. Maybe she said 1900 because my grandfather was born in 1900. So I don't know. that It could be. And then that was a couple years uh, before I found out last year her information, because I found her where? On Family Search, because it filtered her up <laughs> uh, quicker. But I did find where she was born uh, in Sweden, and it, it sure did say, uh, you know, 1900 September. So, okay, so that was kind of right, even yeah. though you may think it's a little off or whatever, you know, whatever the reason is. But at least you have the proof now right. that you know. And so right. that can a- actually open up other mm-hmm. records, you know, now that you know she was born in September 1900. Right. And you don't have to make that date range that right. makes <laughs> you have so many records to right. sift through. Here's the other thing. Then uh, I found her on Alice Island. So, and, but her first name was misspelled. So that gave me more information. Mm-hmm. Her name is Tira, T-Y-R-A. But on the record, it's, T Y S U, because somebody when they're doing the transcript uh, saw the R and it apparently looked like a letter S, and then the U was not an A. <laughs> they thought it was a U. <laughs> anyway, so uh, that's how I found her. I'm like, well, there she is on Ellis Island. So she did come through Ellis Island, bec- uh, Ellis Island, because then one would start to think, well. Did she come through um, another eastern port? Did she come through Canada? Did she come from Louisiana? The cursive writing of yesteryear is not what it is today. It's something totally different today. Mm -hmm. Cursive slash print or just printing, (laughs) you know. Yeah. And I think a lot of people who are transcribing it now, present day, they can't figure it out because if you haven't used cursive in a long time or handwriting a long time, that's you have to be uh, once again a detective trying to figure out what those letters are. Yeah, so, and yeah. Like I know out. that the T's are a little bit different. If there's a T at the end of a word in mm-hmm. cursive in the older days, right. they didn't cross the T, mm-hmm. and the twos are written very strangely. It's just yeah, I've noticed that yeah. even from our day when mm-hmm. we learned cursive in the seventies, <laughs> when I. Well, 70s for me, maybe not for everybody. <laughs> but, uh, 70s for me, too. <laughs> uh, yeah, so they wrote it in a different way. And mm-hmm. it was a lot more curly cues, right. and it seemed to be much more decorative. Because right. it was an art. Yeah, it Handwriting was. was an art in yeah. those days. We just tried to write fast. Right. That's for sure. I know that with my uh, great-grandfather, it's, it's a T, but they wrote it down as a C. So that's why some of the records are off. I kept wondering... Where did this come from? And then I looked at the record and I was like, oh, I see. Because when it's faded. Yeah, and the ink fades. A, a T that's crossed, could, if part of the upper part of the T fades, then, oh, okay, I can see where that might look like a C. Yeah. So it's really interesting when you figure out maybe how some of those mistakes got started. <laughs> yeah, and then if when one mistake, they made a mistake on that record, then maybe they're, that same mistake may be on other records Mm -hmm. as well. My Polish grandparents, their last name was Stasko, S-T-A-S-Z-K-O. And when I went back to the small town where they lived and my mother grew up, the people at the historical society were giving me different phone books from and and they had misspelled it so many different times without the z without the <laughs> s the second s they did it stas key you know that's just in the phone book and that's mm-hmm. typed those typos just creep on in there and you know who knows who was just typing up the phone book in little falls new york right. you know in 1938 <laughs> right. part of the issue with me with family search is that it's hard to go into the try to find the collection just to try to navigate. It's not as user friendly as ancestry is, in my opinion, and that's why sometimes it's uh, it's a little difficult if you're just doing a search in the collections because try to find the collection first. 
<laughs> where it is. But if you just put names and um, so forth, birth date and residence, um, that's a little bit more helpful. But with Ancestry, which is nice, is that it has it if you start typing Sweden or the name of the place or New York or whatever, it'll just kind of autofill for you. But uh, Family Search does not. And that's kind of because you, now you have to type everything out, mm. you know. Oh, comma, yeah, that. A comma is two. <laughs> so what you can do is you can do T, letter T, Y in my case, and then um, uh, use a wild card, uh, which would be an asterisk or a question mark, and that will maybe help. Or just do a first initial with, of course, the last name and the birth, birth date and all that. Uh, and that'll be helpful, too. So to go back, um, when, and I, now I have to remember where I found it, but it was in some, I think it was a manifest, ship manifest, and there was two women who were listed above my Swedish grandmother's name. And one had was like a, a the age of a grandmother, and then the other was the age of a mother. And I'm like, well, no, that's not, now I thinking back that's not the mother so those two people could have been cousins different last name could have been friends different last name could have been um neighbors different last name or just happened to be from sweden who saw my uh swedish grandmother who was 12 at the time sailing alone and they said well we'll watch over her on the ship imagine being 12 years old a young girl on a ship like that, and you don't really have the education or the knowledge of what's happening abroad. <laughs> Where am I going? <laughs> I'm yeah. just uh, set upon this ship. And not everybody right. speaks your language. Exactly. In fact, probably most people don't, because right. you had all types of Europeans right. coming over right. in different languages, and even different little dialects. Right. And if you're in the steerage way down at the bottom of the ship. It couldn't have been pleasant. No. It right. could not have been pleasant. Two completely different worlds, I'm sure. Yeah. And it looked like it averaged folk. about seven to ten days. Yeah. An average of a length of a, of a trip. The right. Atlantic is notoriously not a calm body right. of water. Right. Yeah. That took a lot of guts to leave your family. It sure did. Go yeah. across there. Yeah. And just land where you knew not. You know, I try to think of myself as a 12-year-old, and that would be a, a a little scary. Yeah. You know? Yep. For sure. Yeah. My grandmother was under the impression that she was coming over here for like a year or two mm. and sending all this money back home <laughs> mm -hmm. and go home. Mm -hmm. Well, of course, that didn't happen. Mm hmm that must have been quite a shock to right. think you're going to be making all this money and you're barely being able to live. Right. And we wouldn't know any of these things if we didn't have the Internet. And, you know, it's so much easier to find, Katie, you haven't always used the Internet. <laughs> but we would know nothing about these people. Right. Where would you look at the ship manifest and right. see the actual ship and mm -hmm. all that stuff? So that's why it gets to be so fascinating. Yeah. My grandmother, uh, Tira, she came over on the St. Louis, and that was a, a great find when I found that out because, uh, oh, I have the name of the ship. And you look at the picture because it was on Ancestry, and that's a, that's a good reward after searching for a long time. Yeah, and you see how big those ships are, mm. and you just think walking up that gangplank, mm -hmm. you know, how would that be right. not knowing where you're going right. to kind of end up? Yeah. I tried looking at the um, Ellis Island, but I discovered then that my family came in through Baltimore, and I believe that the ship's name was Ohio, and I think that mm. that was maybe the last year that that ship ran, so <laughs> thankfully it got here with, <laughs> with my ancestors on it. As I was just uh, looking through, the, um, trying to remember the name of the ship, I noticed uh, on the Baltimore records that it said between 1800 and 1823, there's a lot of gaps because records were lost. And um, I know I mentioned in our previous pep talk that there were 
some gaps in shipping records. It's the early 1800s, at least coming into Baltimore, there are some, a lot of gaps because of, I think it was a fire. So lots of records were lost, but they still have tons of records. I'm, I mean, if you think from 1823 until the 40s or 50s, that's still a lot of records. Mm-hmm. And you can enter in a lot of different things. It says heritage.statueofliberty.org. And it looks like they've updated this website. I haven't been on it for a while. But on your passenger search, you can type in, you know, the first name or initial and the last name. But it also gives you some other really interesting uh, alternatives, like um, exact matches, if you know exactly when an ancestor came over and their exact name, or a close match. The last name sounds like, so maybe the name didn't get written down correctly. And alternate spellings, and then last name as first. So those might be some real helpful, if you know an ancestor came through Alice Island, that might be a really good way to pull up some information as a, as a starting point. Right. You know, it was uh, funny, I'm going to look at my phone here, so if you hear any uh, weird noises, that's what's going on. Uh, but, so to go back real quick to my heritage to tie in with Ellis Island. So my Swedish grandmother uh, comes up under Ellis Island and other New York passenger lists, 1820 to 1957. But what's interesting, it will uh, have, uh, let's see, birth, nationality, last permanent residence, which was Sweden in her case, arrival, which was September 28th, 1912 in New York, New York, relative and country of origin, Carl Johnson, parentheses housewife, uh, her father was named Carl with a K, and it wasn't uh, Johnson. So Johnson, I do believe, was the married name of her oldest sister, who probably was a housewife. So see, that part is a little weird. Yeah. And then the other thing, it'll say rel- relative joined in the U.S., Mr. E.A. Johnson, in parentheses, in parentheses, friend. So there is that, and that's kind of cool. And then when it, you click on the name, it'll come up, uh, departure, Southampton, and the ship, St. Louis, age 11. Wow. And isn't that crazy, huh? Yeah. And then it gives uh, an image of, um, it's the... Uh, Source information is passenger and crew lists of vessels arriving at New York, New York, 1897 to 1957. And that's through the National Archives, which is something that we'll touch on in another episode. Because I knew of the misspelling, so if you know of a misspelling that is in a record, use the misspelling. I think that's the moral of this whole story. Well, then that's a good tip. (laughs) Yeah. Because my grandmother's name was... Josephine, but it was Josepha, so that's J-O-Z-E-F-A, but it's been spelled J-O-S-E-F-A, and just, Mm -hmm. or sometimes they did the English Josephine, so you have, sometimes you have to kind of tinker around and find out which, which name and spelling goes with which record. (laughs) Right. Uh, I have the same thing with my great-grandfather, you know, sometimes it's Charles Friedrich William, and sometimes it's Carl Friedrich Wilhelm. It depends on, right. you know, because mm-hmm. he was born in Germany. Right. But uh, so it's very interesting to see which uh, that, that's sometimes I search for, you know, the English form. And then sometimes I search for German and it's a very tangled mess. But. And those were popular names yeah. for yeah, sure. little boys back then, yeah. I am assuming. Cause Yes, a, f- a st- funny story that both my parents' grandfathers' families came from Germany about the same time, and their grandfathers were both named Charlie, some form of Charlie and Fred. So one was oh, yeah. Charles Friedrich, and one was Charlie Fred. <laughs> so, yeah. So when you were searching that, that must have been <laughs> such a weird coincidence. Yeah, it's. Uh, It's definitely interesting, and they, you know, they both came from different parts of Germany, but you see those names. Charles Friedrich had nine brothers and sisters, so there was Carl, there was William, there was Charles Friedrich, you know, there... They were, must have been starting to run out of names. Yeah, Yeah, I think so. Thank goodness there were some girls thrown in, because I think they were getting a little... Mm. Yeah, so it's, it's really interesting to see how 
common those names were because two different entirely different families have the same similarity with names and also if a child was born and then passed on early in their life another child born same sex will have the same first name but maybe a different middle name yeah because they want to honor the original person was named after and maybe name and then maybe honor the little person who died or as i say you have to know your numbers you have to do your numbers because you have to look at the year Mm -hmm. and uh your birth and all these dates especially if you have a lot of people uh by the same name yeah juniors seniors thirds fourths Yeah. yeah i have one one line of my family that on my mother's mother's side that we can trace back pretty far and that happened quite frequently they would have a child die and then three mm-hmm. years later they would have another child and it would have the same name mm-hmm. and then you're going all right is this two people or because right. back in pre-1800 it's really hard to know exactly because what you've basically got to go on is parish records right. or baptisms mm-hmm. those kind of things and too bad they couldn't put 2.0 on there right because <laughs> that would help True. Well, and also, I mean, unless you were a, a well-to-do family, royalty, what's really the purpose of writing down your your yeah, lineage, exactly. you know? Like, I'm sure that most people didn't think about, oh, some day, hundreds of years from now, people are going to wonder who we were. You know, they were just trying to live every day, and yep. they mm-hmm. probably didn't really even consider that, oh, somebody's going to want to know this for sure. Yeah, right. right. <laughs> but here we are, and we do want to know. Yes. Did either of you ladies have a list, another way of finding something out? One of the sources that's been around for a long time, and I remember playing on this with in the early days of the Internet when, like I mentioned before, when you could actually just print out a, a short web page. But Cindy's List is a great website, and it's basically a website of other lists. And it is c-y-n-d-i-s-l-i-s-t dot com cindy's list dot com and it's got a bunch of categories so if you go on the that page and look at categories you've got each state listed out Um, you've got u.s census u.s courts and courthouses U.S. General, and then you've got History, Colonial America, Lewis and Clark, the Depression. It's got links to the Library of Congress, military Uh records for uh, the American Revolution, Civil War, Mexican-American War, Philippine-American War. Wow, so it's kind of organized in a different way. You might get some hits you might not have gotten. Yeah. I have not heard of that. I know it's been around for a long time, and I should know that because my name is Cindy. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. Me of all people. But So I'm excited to get on that and just start tinkering around. It also has links to Ellis Island and Family Search, and um, it also has Mayflower, links to Mayflower. Um, information Mm -hmm. migration routes so if you Mm -hmm. had uh, an ancestor that was let's say indigenous there's information about that and there's also information about the united kingdom and ireland and um, african-american histories there's a ton of stuff on here so basically it's just one big list of more lists you can really go down some great rabbit holes with this site Mm -hmm. so um rabbit holes Within rabbit, rabbit holes. holes. <laughs> yeah. An old hutch. Yeah. <laughs> Talk about Alice in Wonderland on yeah. steroids. So if you want to be a detective in the genealogy world, that is really easy to do. And you will get passionate about it, I'm sure, if you're not already, by the way. And you can just easily go to arapaholibraries.org. You can look for Ancestry.com, MyHeritage.com. Then you can go to the internet and you can search for FamilySearch.org. It's pretty neat. Also, don't forget, check out Cindy's list. And what is it again? It's Heritage.StatueOfLiberty.org. Okay, those are great sites to go to. Because it's happened to me, it's happened to Cindy, it's happened to Katie. Right, ladies? Yeah. Definitely. You will get hooked and you'll put your detective cap on and you'll get your magnifying glass out and you're going to be searching for clues all over the place. And with that said, we thank you very much for listening. But as always, there is a disclaimer. And to add to the fun, the three of us are not certified genealogists. We are just three people who are sitting around and having a gab session about genealogy. We hope that some or all of this information helps you along the way in finding your family. Thanks for listening. Say goodbye, people. 
Goodbye, Goodbye people. people. <laughs> <laughs> nice. We'll see you soon. Thank mm-hmm. you.